Hello! In 2016, when I was working on my book about George Orwell on film and TV, I happened to come across a blog by Kia Lusby about his life in props with his wife Louise. The couple had worked on the John Hurt movie, 1984, and this is their story. I hope you enjoy it. Kia, tell me about your work on 1984. Well, Funny enough, we did that in 1984. <laughs> um, I'm not sure why they did it. I'm, you'd have thought they'd have made it in 1983 and then released it in 1984. But the first work we did, the, in fact, the very first mention in the diary is we had to... Could you, I don't know if you remember, we had, it says in the diary we had to cover a flag with black cloth on the back. Presumably they wanted it so it didn't shine, light didn't shine through it or something. But uh, the main work we did on that was the speak right machines, which were sort of based on very early televisions. I mean, I, the problem you've got when you do a futuristic thing that's written in the past that you've already reached the date that it's set in is how, where do you, in what period in time do you set it, you know? So I imagine they probably thought, well, well, we'll use uh, George Orwell's imagination and assume that he was imagining what it might be like in the future, rather than us imagining what it might be like in the future. So it was all rather early Bakelite televisions and the screen was slightly adapted. And if, you know, it's got that slight curve. <coughs> so it isn't quite the classic uh, 50s television screen. Um, and uh, it, I assume they had thought in the in the stack, almost like a stack of old-fashioned computers. That, um, but we got a drawing for that, and we did make the original hero version of it uh, in wood. And Barry, who worked with, who was an ex-pattern maker, made all that. And I guess I, that was probably all made in gelutum, which is a nice, easy wood to work and often used by pattern makers because it is so stable and has no wild grain or knots or... It's from the rubber tree wood which is interesting because you do get occasionally get where they in, where they go into the wood to take the sap out you get these little holes which are then which then suddenly appear where you don't want them and you have to fill them but that's a bad advice. But I think the original was made in um, in wood, well I'm sure it was made in wood and painted to look like Bakelite, but we did um, all the other ones were vacuum forms. Now I can't remember whether we at that particular time whether we had our own vacuum form or not. I have a feeling not and I think we probably got them vacuum formed at Pinewood mm -hmm. um, who had a big plaster workshop with big vacuum forms and they did all sorts there and I, I think we probably sent the, them there to be done and then assembled and when we got them back made the the hero version of it <coughs> and the rest we cut out which were just uh, thin skin uh, forms off the off the original and as they were in the background receding away um, it didn't have to have quite the same level of detail and I think the I'm not sure does he have a telephone he has a little calculator which they supplied I think they mm. hired but I'm not sure it, whether it has a dial-up telephone in the desk. I don't remember. I can't remember now, but we didn't do... Anyway, if we did, it, we, that was supplied as well. So we basically made the, the bits that you couldn't hire. Because, mm. as a general point, if people can hire things, they don't have them made. Mm. They only make things which they can't. They can either not hire, or if they did hire them, then they want to break them. They can't break them. Mm. So, otherwise, why would you get anything made especially if you could hire it, you know. So 99% of the time it's hired. <coughs> Occasionally it's hired and then copied. But uh, So we did all those. Um, the other large prop that we made was the big screen for O'Brien's office, which has the V for Victory uh, symbol on it, and it has the on and off switch, which is, uh, <laughs> which is why so which is why he's so powerful, because he's about the only man in the country who can switch off the... 
switch off his television. Mm. Nowadays, no one would bother to leave my 24 hours a day. <laughs> <laughs> and people don't mind being watched quite the same, do they? They film themselves. Mm. And so, uh, you know, in, the, in 1984, in the actual 1984, all that was to come. Mm. Um, and the people making the film that was set in 1984, making in 1984, had no idea what was around the corner. I mean, mobile phones. I don't even think we're a twinkle in anybody's eye. Probably by '87, mm. I think they'd started turning up as a uh, suitcase with a 20 batteries in the suitcase and a big phone that you had to. <laughs> but I think in 1984, it's interesting if they'd made it in 1994, 2004, whether or not all that technology would be different, you know. Mm. Um, because you could do it now, couldn't you, easily? It's a, but anyway, that's be amusing. Um, but the, as I say, we made a larger version of the screen for um, O'Brien's office and the on and off switch, and uh, which was all rather... In sock. In sock, yes. And we made toggles for um, the youth to wear on their, like little Boy Scout toggles around their kerchiefs and belts. And we made... Um, well, anything that needed the symbol, basically, we made. Mm. And Louise got more involved in the pencil that has to uncoil the cardboard uh, pencil. That was We got a stick of graphite, which are long and about a quarter inch thick. And Louise discovered that the perfect... Um, we sent David, our buyer, off yes. to buy every um, <coughs> Tampax um, tampon size. Uh, and discovered that the outer super was exactly the right size to disguise, to take the message and um, put the pencil and in. It fitted, the, it fitted the graphite, little graphite stick in the end quite nicely. And it also had a nice, you could coil. uncoil it. Like a coil a, of you know, a bit like a lavatory roll, it's got that, lots of card tube is always made in a... So in I a had, car. I rang up. Um, the company that produces Tampax and spoke to the chap there and said what we had to do and I said ideally I'd like the cardboard tubes without the dimples in which they put in by machine and um, longer length than the norm so he said well if you send somebody this afternoon there'll be um, a bundle of tubes for you to collect and I said and how much will we owe you no that's absolutely fine it won't cost you anything so we got these long tubes exactly what we wanted and then cut them up and yeah. made them into pens and the rest is history we also made a set, slightly different version for O'Brien in a chrome, a chrome yes, version chrome. which was just a, a plastic tube there used to be a company locally called EMA Supplies who had tube from minute up to any size you wanted. They all slotted one inside the other very, and domes and it was fantastic. And I think one of their tubes was the right size and we had it. There was another company locally that did um, vacuum metalising. Everything was put in a vacuum chamber and bombarded with aluminium powder basically and it gave you a chrome finish. So, and then the, this took the same bit of graphite so they all had the same, they all had the same pencil. But if you were Brian, you had a chrome version. If you <laughs> were the Hoggerlo, you had. And the, yes, and if you had, you know, you had a what could have been the Tampax. <laughs> 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 the other thing we did uh, in the film, which the, the only thing I've got left from the film, personally, is that's uh, the paperweight that O'Brien buys. Winston. Or sees, Winston, not O'Brien. Yeah. Sorry, Winston buys. This was the very first one we made. I think this was the first one, and the problem was that when you put something like a piece of coral or anything into a into a sphere uh, solid, it magnifies it, and it's a bit like a snow scene, which we made many of. Um, and as soon as you put a little object inside a sphere that's solid or full of water, it gets a lot bigger. And they wanted to film through the the actual. Um, Coral to see that I think it was a note, a bank note, or some note was it? I, I'm, I'll have to watch the film again. Um, 
and they said no it's far too big so can you make it smaller well the problem is that we had to make a, we made this shape as a um, as a shape and made a silicon mold which we then suspended the coral in and then poured it full of clear resin in those days it was a much trickier job because they hadn't perfected the resin and it got very very hot and tended to shatter inside and you can do it in layers but it, it, then you've got a problem with dust getting in between the layers so we did it several times going smaller and smaller and smaller with the coral until we ended up with a probably a piece of coral no bigger than your little fingernail which got bigger inside but still left enough clear around to, for them to, to view through but so I ended up with this one because they uh, they, they decided it wasn't for their liking but then we cast it in clear resin and got the mould out and of course you didn't get a nice polished surface so then we had to polish it with uh, well we started off with different grits of wet and dried um, and down to about 600 or 800 and then finished it off with Perspex polish till it becomes nice and clear mm. I had a similar thing we made for Arthur C. Clarke's Mr. I know it's nothing to do with 2000, uh, sorry, 1984, <coughs> but he wanted a crystal skull. Oh, yes. Yeah, and we, some of them are a bit weird. They're not really, you know, they're not, they're not actual, they don't look that much like a modern skull. But anyway, we cast up a skull, a plastic skull that we bought, and we cast it in clear resin. But of course, it had to be polished inside and out because it was hollow. We couldn't cast a big lump without it getting too hot so we did it hollow and I spent three days polishing it down through very rough sandpaper down to as I say almost to a 1200 grit and then perspex polish and almost brasso by the end um, and I lost my finger net, fingerprints I, my fingers had started to bleed anyway because <laughs> they were getting but none of my finger ends had fingerprints on I'd just worn them off with all this polishing Anyway, and that's uh, they used it for the opening titles of uh, mm. Arthur C. Clarke's Mysterious World. So that's uh, that, that's that. That's it. Yeah, and I can't remember. I don't. We did other bits and pieces, yeah. but nothing that you'd note really. But you actually had to go on set. Yeah, right. we had, we with the with the um, we had to one day because they uh, well we had to deliver the big television for O'Brien's set because. Um, Richard Burton, whose last film it was, had arrived and was going to film that scene. And so we, they said, could you put it on? So we did. Uh, and I think the chippies also f set it up and he got rather marked because the chrome paint wasn't very stable and needed longer to dry than we had. So there were the odd fingerprints. So we did not only be take it over to the stage, but um, what, about eight o'clock one morning they came rushing in and said, could you just you know, brighten it up a bit. So <laughs> we were over there um, masking it up and spraying it with a bit more chrome spray. And I don't touch it. Whatever you do, don't touch it. It's fine. And as long as you didn't touch it, it was fine. So I need the knob, knob was further down. So that wasn't a problem. But that was, I think, the only time we went on set on that film. We didn't often do that. They, uh, we, bit, we were too busy in the workshop, you know. Occasionally they say, would you like to come over and look at the set? And we had a bit of an hour's troop round. But it didn't happen very often, did it? No. You seem to remember that it was a, a bit of a rush production. Well, it seemed to be. I don't know whether... I think they... Whether they decided to do it the year before and wanted to get it out before the end of 1984. I mean, we were still working on it in the middle of 1984, so... They didn't have a lot of time to um, to to edit it and get it out, and and he was still uh, he was still. I, I think it got in, in 1985 by the time it got round the world. I would think, which is odd, really. You'd think you know maybe they could have flagged it up earlier and had it, you know. But maybe somebody had a bright idea. Too late. <laughs> Well, Kia was on the right track there. The movie was made very quickly, having only been agreed at the end of 1983, and it came out in October of 1984. Anyway, that's my video. I hope you enjoyed it, and that's all from me. Bye-bye.